This episode is presented by Brex, the financial stack founders can bank on. Learn more at brex.com slash techcrunch24. Working with data can be extremely frustrating. Data teams are often tasked with cleaning, scraping, and making use of messy and seemingly useless data. Having functioning dashboards is essential for tracking success and meeting benchmarks. You're listening to Found, TechCrunch's podcast that brings you the stories behind the startups. Today, we're talking to Prakalpa Shanka, the co-founder and CEO of Atlan, a platform revolutionizing the way data teams collaborate and manage their data. I'm Becca Skutak, and here to talk numbers with me is my fabulous co-host, Dominic Midori Davis. And of course, before we get into our conversation, we have our two truths and a lie. And at the end, we'll tell you which one of these statements isn't true. So listen carefully. Is the lie that Prakalpa and her co-founder met on a bus and have been working together for over 12 years? that she once had to fix a dashboard just minutes before it was shown to the president of France, or that her team wrote a manifesto to ensure that they built a company that they would have wanted to partner with. Listeners, you will have to keep listening to find out. But before we get to that conversation with Prakalpa, a quick reminder to rate and review the show. You can do so in whichever application you are already listening to this podcast on, so easy for you and super helpful for us. And without further ado, here's our conversation with Prakalpa. Hi, Prakalpa. How's it going? Hi, Becca. It's going great. So nice to be here. No, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. I think what makes the most sense to get started is maybe if you want to start by telling us a little bit about Atlan. Yeah. So at Atlan, we think of ourselves as a home for data teams. Sort of what GitHub is for an engineering team or Salesforce is for a sales team. We become that layer inside an enterprise for the data and AI teams. The interesting thing about the data and AI team is that who is the data and AI team? Because in most organizations, everyone inside the organization is touching data in some way or form. And what we do is bring together all of the different kinds of data assets inside an organization. So, you know, your dashboards, your reports, your tables, and so and so, stitch it together to create a single source of truth and then ultimately make it easy for it end users to have like sort of like almost like a Google-like search experience, easily find, trust, and in today's world, govern the data inside their organizations. Interesting. And I'm curious, like what got you interested in building the company to begin with? What was your background that led up to deciding to launch this? I've been a data practitioner my whole life. Prior to this, I founded a company that did a lot of work in the data science for social good space. So my co-founder and I had built this company called Social Cops. We did a lot of work building India's national data platform, which is the largest public sector data lake of its kind. Did a lot of work with the United Nations on the global SDG agenda and incorporating data science into that. And so basically, we were the data team <laughs> for our customers. And we were trying to solve these like big world problems in healthcare and education and poverty alleviation and so and so. So what happened was while we were working on these projects, they all seemed kind of like really cool projects and dream projects from the outside, right? Like we were dealing with data for 500 million Indian citizens and billions of pixels of satellite imagery a day and things like that. On the inside, it was not cool or fun at all. It was just chaos every day. I feel like I went through maybe every fire drill that a data leader can possibly go through. My worst ones were once getting this call from the prime minister's office of India at eight in the morning saying the number on this dashboard doesn't look right and we're going to go to show this to the prime minister in the next 15 minutes. Can you tell me what happened? Oh, and I God. literally like remember like jumping off out of my bed. I open up my laptop. There's a 2x spike overnight in the data. And I have no idea why. Like, I don't know how to answer this question. And right there, like that was two years of trust that I had built with my stakeholder. And I could like feel it evaporate on that call. I wasn't even because something was wrong. It was because they told me that something was wrong and I couldn't tell them why, mm. right? And and that's the interesting thing about trust. If something was wrong and I'd just been able to proactively, like if we just been able to proactively tell them, hey, this pipeline here today failed and this happened, which is why there's like something off with your data, don't use this today, trust wouldn't have broken. And that was just one example of the story in our lives. Like just to give you an example in that moment, it took us four people eight hours to figure out what went wrong, not even fix it. And our team was spending 50, 60% of our time dealing with these issues and challenges around context and trust. And the interesting thing that we realized in that time was the reason these challenges were so difficult for us was because 
the data team is really one of the most diverse team that exists inside an organization. Like to make a data project work, you need an analyst, an engineer, a scientist, a business person. All of these people have their own different skill sets, their own DNA in the way that they work. And that means that they don't have the same shared language. They don't speak the same language. They don't use the same tools. They're fundamentally different in their DNA. And that made collaboration really, really hard. And that's why, like, there's like some insane stats, like, given, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are spent in data every year, only 27% of data projects are actually successful. Mm. Like, only 27% actually go live. And that's insane. And like, but that's like, if you talk to like a data person, they'll be like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, that's kind of like the number. And so that's how we got started. So actually, we never meant to actually sell Ashwin as a product to anyone else. We just started building the product for ourselves. We we failed a couple of times ourselves. I tried to buy a solution. Obviously, the first thing you try and do is like you buy a solution. You don't like decide to build it. Try to buy a solution. Failed three times over with the traditional solutions that existed in the market at the time. And the fourth time around, actually built Atlum for ourselves. Ran 200 data projects ourselves as a team. Made our team significantly more agile and effective. And then said, hey, is there a way we can go help these teams around the world? So that, that's how we stumbled upon the problem. Wait, I'm so curious now. What went wrong with the data? Oh my God, that's such a great question. So basically what happened was we were pulling from this CRM ERP system. That was the source data. And that day, someone made a change in the actual database. And so instead of them sending us daily data, so they used to send us daily data. And then what used to happen in the dashboard is like you would basically do a sum. So you would add up, right? To show a cumulative. That day, someone decided to like switch that around and like it didn't get caught and they sent us cumulative data. And so there was like a 2x spike. Like it was just the data feed that came as was a cumulative as on date. And like it just spiked everything 2x and it didn't get caught anywhere in the ecosystem. If you use Atlin today, that won't happen. <laughs> but, uh, and we have these things called data contracts. So, you know, you can like actually have these contracts between like publishing systems and like, you know, like the, the consuming systems and things like that. But, oh my gosh, it was, yeah, it was, it was actually like something very straightforward. And But you were able to rebuild like the trust and everything, right? Yeah, it, it took a while, right? It took a while and it took a lot of, you know, sleepless nights. And I remember, I think there was a period in time when I, I don't think I left office for six months. Like we were growing so fast. Like I would like wake up with a fire drill every morning and we would do something to like fix it that evening. And like, I, you know, like I would go to sleep that night and I would wake up the next morning with another fire drill. So it wasn't easy. It took a lot. And we kind of hit this breaking point where we were like, we just can't scale like this anymore. Like we're just in like constant reactive hero mode. And the reason we're able to like make all these projects work is just because like we just power through. Like there shouldn't be a reason this works. It's just that like, we care so much about our customers that we're going to find a way to make it work. And you don't scale anything like that, right? And we were like, we need a better system to scale. And that's kind of like we hit this breaking point. And that was kind of when we were like, okay, we just need to build better tooling for our team to make this more effective. And I'm curious, especially with the stat that you said earlier, it seems like this is such a huge problem kind of across the board with companies that interact with data and sort of work on these types of projects. So what was it like actually coming up with that idea that you guys wanted to build tools, even if just for yourself, and actually being able to build it out into something that works? You'd think if it's such a problem for everyone that people would have like at least tried to figure it out or like maybe it's really difficult to figure out. So like, how did you guys navigate that? The timing of this was interesting. So this was like 2016. So this was when the data stack looked and felt very different. This was when companies like Snowflake and Databricks had like 12 customers. So the world was very different. It was very like cloud was not really a thing. People had not really started moving their data to the cloud. We were just in the very early innings of what today is called the modern data and AI, cloud stack and things like that. Software was changing massively, right? This was like early days of Slack, right? Like if you think about the world that we lived in at the time. And... We just happened to be one of the early modern data teams. So this problem has existed forever. Like this problem has existed for like 20 years. But the way the problem was solved was in this very like top down. IT teams are going to use this for compliance. Like that was kind of like the way that some of these problems were solved at the time. And we happened to be a very modern data team. Like we were using Slack every day. We just happened to be one of those early teams. And we realized that what existed in the market didn't work for us. In fact, 
we failed three times over. Like once we tried to buy, once we tried to use open source. Every big tech company at the time ended up the legacy tools didn't work for them. So they ended up building some version of an internal tool to solve for this problem. And some of that got open source. We tried that. We tried to build ones ourselves and we failed that time. And we took actually a lot of those learnings to the fourth time around. And I think that's till date build the founding principles of our product. Like today we actually have customers who have failed with this, you know, and we do a survey with them and we're like, why do you fail? But like, a tool in the past or something like that. And they kind of tell us the same reason, which is insane, but it was like existing tools were too manual. Like we never got up and running with it. And like, you know, they would say it was too siloed. Like it was not adoption first. It was not collaborative. So for example, in our case, we just integrate into workflows in Slack or in Teams or in BI tools. So for example, you know that question inside a company where people go like, how do we define revenue again? Like, hey, like, what do we mean by total customer count? Like, you know, like those kinds of questions. Like, people are asking those questions on Slack or Teams, or people are in BI tools, or people are already in tools that they're working in. So, in our case, like, instead of our software being this new place that they need to go to, we actually just push this context into tools that people are working and we pioneer that. We call it active metadata, we pioneered that in the industry. And fundamentally, these are closed platforms, they don't open up the metadata. And all this context for, you know, developer use cases, we're very developer first. Everything in Athlon is fundamentally open. Our customers can build sort of like apps on top of all of this metadata, which especially now in the AI world is becoming really important. Like a lot of our customers are starting to look at Athlon as this trust layer to power their AI and LLM applications. And none of that would be possible without that fundamental platform layer. All this to say we had this unique vantage point of being the team that lived the problem every day. Mm -hmm. So we really genuinely for like a couple of years just were building for ourselves. So like the way this worked was we had a data team and then we had this like engineering team and the goal of the engineering team was to make the data team more effective. Like that was the whole thing. Like and they used to sit right next to each other. So like imagine you're building a product and for like two years, your users are like right next to you and you're like, you know, they are left friends with them and they like complain to you about this one thing in their day-to-day work. And I think that early empathy combined with the fact that we happened to be in the very early days of this whole new stack getting built out. So we were also the right kind of team. So today there are more teams like us. Like back in 2017, I think I could have counted on my fingers the number of teams that were adopting the kind of workflows and stacks we were adopting at the time. Today, there are probably like 25,000 teams like that in the world, right? So we just happened to also be the right kind of team. So we were getting feedback from the right kind of users in those early days. I think that was the journey to build the first version of the product. It was a whole different journey to go to market. And, you know, we had a horizontal product, which means we can sell to anyone. We can sell to any industry. We can sell to any company size, which is amazing. Like if you talk to an investor and you're like, total addressable market, you're like, yes, this is awesome. Like it's a great market. It's a horrible go-to-market challenge. Like, it's terrible. Like, you're like, how do I find repeatability? Who are my first? Like, you want to build repeatability as you scale go-to-market. And so there was this whole, like, we actually maybe ran one of the most data-driven processes that I know of to find product market fit and go-to-market fit. And that was this whole different journey that we had to take after we built the first version of the product. And thinking about that first version, it is really interesting to hear the concept of, like, building this in-house before spinning it out sitting, like you said, next to the people who are you're trying to build the product for, how do you think that helped you? Do you think it helped you kind of be able to get stuff answered faster, find product market fit a little bit quicker? Or were there any downsides to being like that close to the actual building of the product and that close to the users at first? I think the thing that it has created for us, and I think this is kind of true till today at Atlan, it created empathy for us in a way that just like no company could have that. I remember even before we really launched the first version of the product to like customers, I remember someone looked at me and they said like, what is your competitive advantage? And we didn't really have a product. We didn't really have like, you know, a customer. And so I was like, I remember saying like, we have empathy. Like we cared about this problem. Like, I was a data leader. And I remember what it felt like that night when I went to sleep. I remember what it felt like when I went up to the terrace and cried for three hours that morning. Like, I just like really don't want this to happen to anyone else. Right. And that was true for 
like our whole family team almost our whole family team just had empathy like they all had these really personal experiences of how painful it was and it gave us empathy for our users in a way that i just don't think and this is true till today like before we we sold the first version of the product we wrote this manifesto and we said we want to build a kind of company we wished we could have partnered with when we were a data team ourselves and that kind of like shape all of our product decisions our business decisions they come from that but we have a unusual number of data practitioners in the company like our density of data practitioners who get the customer compared to like overall people it's very high and that's been core i think as a differentiator you ask me is there a downside i think the only downside was and i think we tried to solve for this in other ways but you're almost too close to the problem right right and there's a difference between building a product to solve a problem and building a product that can win the market and those two things don't necessarily always go together and we had to like actually the first version of the product we took to market i think was like a perfect product like it was like perfect but it was just really hard for like new customers to like change manage and take it into their into like you know and so we i think there were some things that you know if i look back i think we would have done a little differently in the approach but in the larger scheme of things like what would i trade off like would i trade off the empathy absolutely not i think that's even till today i think that is our biggest competitive advantage i know you mentioned when you guys got started of course like we weren't talking about ai very much people were kind of just moving to the cloud tech has changed a lot since you guys launched what has it been like for you guys to adapt your company to solve these different challenges now that that back end tech has changed so much yeah it's interesting i recently gave the talk it was about getting your data ai ready you know like atlas today enables our customers to get their data ai ready and we're like a foundational tool for them to get to their ai outcomes and roadmaps that people are building and i started with this hot take and my hot take was how to get my data ai ready is the wrong question to be asking today and the synthesis of that was if you think about the last sort of 10 years of technology evolution technology has evolved at a much faster pace than ever before like even if you think about data like 10 years ago like we were just starting to implement hadoop like we were not even really implemented like we just started to implement hadoop and the cloud was just starting to become a thing and then like 4 years later we have all these like cloud like the cloud is really a thing and we are starting to implement these like cloud data warehouses and companies like snowflake and databricks and these companies started like really taking off and that was like you know a four year era and then ai happens and now we're all like upping the stack and so what's happened is what used to be cycles of innovation that you know if you think about 200 years ago were like 50 year cycles and then that started shrinking and you were like okay 10 years 15 years and now you're like 5 years 3 years 2 years right like and the cycle and is it going to slow down it's not it's actually going to get faster and so then the real question to be asking internally is how do you build almost the fastest learning and adaptable company and this is something that we tell our customers like where like your data stack the way you think about this is you need to be ready for whatever comes in 2 years because it's going to be different from and not anything that you and I are talking about today and i think for us as a company what that's meant is knowing that that's the reality of the ecosystem we operate in we believe the only reality in our space is diversity there'll always be diversity of people tools use cases and the second reality is change it is a fast changing fast evolving ecosystem So what does that mean if we want to be the partner for data teams in this journey we need to be the fastest learning company in the world we need to be the most agile company in the world and if we continue to be able to learn very quickly about the problems that our customers are facing as they adopt to this new world we're able to solve those problems and we need to be really agile as we think about our product organization to be able to shift for it and that's been a foundational principle like we have an operating model now that is built around this principle i think that has been maybe the most interesting thing about company building i think in our phase and how we would adapt to that more from this conversation right after a quick break what has it been like building during this AI revolution. I feel like I have a few AI questions, but first, I feel like there's this big debate on if AI is a bubble right now. So, I always love <laughs> asking people because everyone has like different thoughts. So, I mean, the first question is, do you think we're in a bubble right now of AI? I think it depends on what you define as bubbles, right? 
Is there a lot of hype right now? And do we have a lot of money being thrown at AI? And are there like, you know, lots and lots of companies that are being formed that, you know, we don't really know. Like in that form, yeah, we are definitely in a bubble. But is this technology that's really going to be there and change the way we work? No, we're not in a bubble at all. I think if you think about like big technology evolution, you know, in the last whatever, like there was the internet, many of us were not really around to like build that, build that fundamental thing that changed in the world because the internet, maybe the next time it happened was with smartphones. I think, you know, yeah, it's definitely there. It's up there. So will everything that we know about the world change pretty drastically in the next few years, five, seven years? Yeah, that's probably true. Is that overhyped or... You know, there is a part of it that's overhyped. I do think that there's a lot happening today, which is just a it's a function of how like financial markets work and how like when like it's a version of that. And in that world, I do think there's parts of it that are hype, and it's going to take cycles before all of this plays out. And I'm curious though, with the rise of AI and sort of what we're seeing there, it just seems like everyone is just willing to throw so much money at literally anything in that space, anything involved. How is this affecting you guys? Are you finding more inbound interests? Are you finding more people coming to you, like looking to sort of use a product like this? Like how has the rise of AI affected you guys and your building journey? Yeah, it's been interesting. I think Gartner did a survey this year of chief data officers and they asked them what they're spending on. And 54% said, surprise, surprise, generative AI. And 53% said data governance. And so what's been really interesting for us is as a space, our demand has been rising significantly because there is this realization that what is going to take, like there's this joke that a lot of data leaders talk about, which is it's a meme now. And it says, everyone's ready for AI, except your data. And the real challenge in operationalizing these AI use cases inside a company is the data. I was talking to a chief data officer the other day, and he said, we have a thousand AI use cases to operationalize in my roadmap over the next like 18 months. And I can't get to any of it because my data is not ready. Like that is the first problem I have to solve. And what people are realizing as they deploy a lot of this internally is a lot of people think that the challenge is really going to be, you know, you go in thinking that the model is going to be the hard part, but actually the things that you thought were going to be hard are actually turning out to be pretty easy. And the things that you would think were pretty easy are actually turning out to be pretty hard. Like the problems we hear a lot are like, when I'm training a model internally in my company and I'm an investment firm, TAM and my company means total addressable market. In the internet, it could mean like a hundred things. But for me, in my company, it means total addressable market. When I'm deploying a chatbot for my HR team versus the rest of my teams, my HR team's chatbot can use payroll data. But actually, I probably don't want payroll data to be used in the rest of the applications inside of the organization. And how do you, like, depending on who's asking the question, how do I actually make sure only the right data is going into that answer. You know, these are hard, complex challenges to solve in like data estates that are sprawling with, you know, hundreds of data sources and pretty complex data estates. And so we're seeing a pretty significant investment into the foundational tooling in data and AI governance, which is the space that we operate in to get enterprises to be AI ready. So yeah, it's been good. I mean, I think what that means for us is I feel very much like we're kind of at this right place at the right time moment. We've been building for all of these things and some of these hypotheses, like, you know, change is going to happen. And when change happens, you have to be resilient and you have to build trust and context and all of these things in data. A lot of that is playing out now and accelerating the need for tooling like us inside an organization. And as someone who works with data, I know that like, or not me, you. (laughs) I know that a big conversation has, or at least like with some founders has been, you know, how to avoid the bias that AI has. Like all AI is going to have some form of bias and, you know, the data outputs and all these things. And so I wanted to know kind of your perspective on how you see the best way to not eliminate, but maybe like lessen the bias that a lot of the data will inevitably have. People are kind of, I don't know if there's a lot of clarity in terms of like the right thing to do. Yeah, it's still early, but I think some of the patterns we're seeing in the companies that are the most forward ahead in this 
One is we're seeing companies almost think of this concept of AI ready data. And you can think of that as an AI ready data score. So we we have this concept called data products in Atlan. You can create this score of is this data ready for AI? And what's the score associated with it? So you can say completeness, accuracy, compliance checks. If you think about bias, like what are some like, you know, you can calculate for like frequency distribution in the data for male versus female, or like, you know, you can start coming up with like ethical scores around like things that matter. And you use that to say, hey, this is the score of AI ready data. And then what you can say is, if this is a business user querying on the other side, and they're actually going to use this to make like a final decision, my score probably has to be greater than nine for this to be used inside an org. On the other hand, if it's a data scientist who's using it for an internal project, probably is going to be a little bit more judicious about the way they use this. You know, it's okay if my score is seven, right? And so that's been one sort of like practical application and in the investments that we're seeing people make in the way that they're working towards this. I think the second thing that's important is to realize that humans are going to be very important in these loops that we build with AI. And we think a lot about what are the human flows and how can you create turbocharged. It's likely that AI is going to be like sort of like almost co-workers to humans in this process, right? And so if you think about the human in the loop process and you think about the right way for humans to collaborate with a new kind of knowledge worker, according to me, inside the organization and create those loops that are effective. So we as an organization, as a society, are actually doing the right thing for the world. I mean, that's really the role of a human, right? I think those loops are super critical. And we're seeing the best teams think a lot about what those loops are inside organizations. And I know you guys raised $105 million in funding earlier this year. I have a two-part question here. One, I'm curious what fundraising for the company has been like and if you have noticed more investor interest sort of as we've seen these changes in AI. And the second part, I am going to make you talk about the Taylor Swift torture data department video you guys made (laughs) to announce the funding. So I need to hear about that as well. Yeah, I think we happen to be in a fortunate space in the sense that our space is growing rapidly. The company has been growing like, you know, we've grown seven X in the last two years, like 30 X in the last three years. Right. And so I think we happen to be in, in a position and I say this with a lot of gratitude and humility, like, you know, we happen to be in a position that has made things easier for us in an otherwise brutal and fun. It, it's not been an easy fundraising in my right? right. And so we say that with a lot of gratitude. And I think in our case, something that's been really important to us is we think of ourselves as building an enduring company. We want to build a company that can last a hundred years maybe more than a hundred years, right? And actually there are not a lot of companies in tech that have lasted a hundred years. It's actually, like, you know, we're very, very, like we're infants in this journey of building and enduring companies. And we think a lot about as we surround ourselves with investors, we want to bring the right people on board and people who can stand the test of time with us and the ups and downs that will come with that. That's been important to us. And so we've always invested very early in long-term relationships and a lot of the people that we have on our cap table have been helpful to the company for years before they actually invested in the company. And that's just been a conscious choice in the way that we built the company. There's a pretty strong demand in AI and data right now, right? And I think that's a pretty fair statement to make. It's like, I think, a fact at this point. But I think that's true for any... I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. You know, Varun and I, my co-founder and I, we were, you know, we ran a bootstrap company before this. I think the most important thing that I've learned is like build a good business and everything else will work itself out. Like love your customers, everything else will work itself out. And those have just been the things that we want to like put our heads down and focus on the whole time. And the video, you guys, I mean, the Taylor (laughs) Torture Data Department, it's so good. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, we're a fun team and we were like, oh, like there's this like fundraise thing that we're announcing and you know, like our day one, there was like, we got all this coverage and we were like on Forbes and Fortune, like all these awesome like press publications. And then we were like, this doesn't feel like Atlan. Like, you know, like we should, what's a unique way that we can like make our personality go? And, you know, Taylor, obviously that was, it, it just happened to be like the tortured poet society. It had just dropped. Like we have like a pretty strong like Taylor, like Swifty community in the company. Love that. We were like, oh, like, what is a better version of, you know, like, maybe there's a version of, like, us just, you know, making up a song and 
dancing on it and announcing like the fundraise. And so we came up with this idea of the torture data department. And it was this way of announcing, we came up with like lyrics of how hard it is for data people and like how, you know, now at Lung <laughs> And it was just a lot of fun. And the whole team came, it we're a global team, so we're global remote. And this was like totally like that. Like we were like, oh, like let's come up with this idea. And oh, we're going to like announce, do this in like two days, right? Like we didn't really have time. Like it was all produced indoorly and we just, and so like the whole team got like really creative and we had people all over the world, like go dance and like go like come up with props and you know, like they shot it and we all came together and someone wrote the lyrics and someone sang it and we, we announced it. And we just, it was just a way for us that like we, we say we're on this mission to help the humans of data. We call our users humans of data. Humans of data do their lives best work. And a large part of everything we do is centered around this idea of the human and helping the human collaborate in the best way possible. And we kind of take that internally too. Like we, you know, like we actually have an internal one on like, can we help every human of Atlin do their life's best work? And a part of that is building an awesome team that has fun. <laughs> and as we go through these challenges, so that's actually how it happened. Wait, I feel like I have to ask your favorite song is, what's your era? Which era are you? Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, I'm old school. Like my favorite song still comes from like the, you know, you belong with me and <laughs> love story days. Like I'm still very much the original Taylor, like Swifty <laughs> era. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. I'm a, I'm a red girl. I had to ask. I had to ask. But I know that we're running out of time. And but, so I did have like one question, mostly about you and your co-founder. This is the second company you've started. It's like a mixture of a question and a statement of just like, what is it like starting two companies with the same person? And how do you kind of manage that relationship? How do you guys say on such good terms to yeah. launch two companies? I feel like it's maybe one of the most fortunate relationships that I've had. Sometimes like, it's like literally serendipity. Like we met on a bus. Like, you know, like there's like no reason. <laughs> like we should have founded a company and stayed together for like what 12 years now to like 13 years now but I think what's been for me like and we, we were 21 when we started right like that was the and Varun and I I think the very interesting thing about the relationship has been values alignment so we're very different people actually our leadership styles are extremely different which means that like day to day like you know we have strong opinions about the way we want to like solve problems but we have never thought about anything important. Like it's been 12 years and like we have at a fundamental values level on what's important to us. We have never thought about that. And I think it's the thing about founder, like building a company together. It's like, you're literally, like I think about Atlin as this like child, you know, and it's like your responsibility to get this child that was just born to like be a really healthy living adult. You know, like, for example, like I described this in Dorney, like, I'm like, now Aslan's a teenager and, you know, like, it, it, I'm a teenage teenager, like, I'm really proud of this teenager, but like, now it's going, like, we're going to go through all these, like, teenage problems that we're going to have to figure out how the teenager can make its own decisions, but given the guardrails of the values that matter to us and, you know, things like that. And I think it's really important that when you're kind of like, Brian Chesky said this thing when you're like the biological parent, like, you know, like Byron and I are like, we're sort of like the parents of the thing. You have to have values alignment. Like you have to believe that this is what we want the, the adult to look like. And these are the things that we want compromise in that journey. And I think that's probably been one of, that's why I say we're fortunate because it's one thing for that to last for a few years. It's a totally different thing for that to last 12 or 13 years and hopefully for a much longer time going ahead. And unfortunately, we are out of time. The time flew by. So we're, I think we're going to wrap it there on such a nice note. But thank you so much again for coming on the show. This has been really fun. Thank you, both. This was awesome. And that was our conversation with Prakalpa. Dom, what was the lie? The lie was that she had to fix the dashboard just minutes before it was shown to the president of France because it was not the president of France. It was actually the prime minister of India. Yeah, I thought that was so interesting hearing about her company prior to this and sort of all of the work they were doing and how that inspired the current company. Essentially, all of the fires they had to put out every day at their old company inspired them to launch a completely new one, which I always find that to be a super interesting path to launching a company. I know. She has one of those founder stories which remind me of 
how much you have to love being a founder because no way am I putting fires out every day and then launching another company. Oh, I know. I'm in my soft girl era. That's a lot, I feel. Like, you have to love it. You're so right. She was talking about, like, crying all the time about like all these problems that kept coming up and instead of just being like I'm gonna back away and I'm just gonna not touch this anymore because it's driving me insane being like you know what like what if we just launched another company and fix the issue but I mean I guess part of that's because they originally didn't think it would be another company they were just trying to solve their own internal problems but I thought that whole aspect of it was interesting too the concept of like essentially incubating the company in your own startup Uh, yeah I actually love the idea of like you identifying a problem. And then, so it's one of those things where it's like, fine, I'll do everything myself. Literally, yeah. And like just creating a solution to your, to the problem. But also I'd be terrified if like any government called and was like, by the way, there's a problem with this data. I think I'd be like freaked out. No, it sounds like she was too. And like totally understandably so. The problem she was talking about originally is so interesting to me in the sense that these things happen all the time. And like the data just produces something wrong and like no one knows why. I guess I didn't realize that was like an issue was that it just like you wouldn't know why it was showing the wrong thing. And she gave a really important point, which I felt was philosophical in a sense, but it was about how the main problem was it wasn't just that something went wrong, but that she couldn't tell them like what went wrong and and why it happened. And I feel like there's a deeper meaning in that. Like, I don't know, it touched me for some reason. I was like, yeah, you know, like she couldn't say why. And that in itself, like losing trust from that, it's like, I feel like you can take that and apply it to life. I can't figure out how exactly right now, but I feel like there's a deeper meaning in that. No, for sure. Just the concept of like, sure, we can both agree it's wrong, but the fact that we don't know why it's wrong is like what's troubling about it. You could definitely see that apply to other areas. And I always love talking to AI companies or companies that were using all of these technologies before it became trendy as of like last year. I know. Data is such an interesting thing because it's like now we talk about it all the time with like, training large language models and doing things like that. But it's like, of course, companies have always had problems with their data and just running dashboards. So it's interesting to talk to a company that was founded like seven years ago. She was talking about how like people weren't even fully adopting the cloud at that point and how much just like you have to just expect technology is going to keep changing and you have to build a company that is prepared to adapt for continuous change, which is something that I'm sure applies to like a bunch of companies in a bunch of areas. But I've never heard someone just like put it so blatantly like, no, to build a company, you have to build one that's ready for technology to change like every year. I know that's another thing about being a founder. And also, I love that she was talking about the cloud because, okay, so obviously we were kids when the cloud came out. And I remember thinking that they were like cloud, like mystical, like where does all of this go? And they're actually like servers in the bay or something like that. So I was like, okay, so it does go someplace. But I was like, even thinking about a a pre-cloud world is like, what were people doing before the cloud? With their data? Yeah, I don't know. I guess like big servers and stuff. We're gonna, we're really showing our age here. We're like, how did the internet work before the cloud? I don't wait, know. Yes. <laughs> Why do we always do that? We're just like, wait a minute. Did you guys like have like books back then? <laughs> like something really insane. We always do that to founders. I feel bad. <laughs> no, we literally do. But speaking of like the time period aspect of it. Her story of meeting her co-founder is so funny to me. I know. You talk to people at companies all the time and they're like, we've been friends since middle school. And you're like, okay, cool. And like, she was just like, we met on a bus and then decided to launch two companies together. And it's like, okay, slay. Like, (laughs) I wish we had more time to dive into this because I need to know what was happening on that bus. Because when I'm on a bus, I don't talk to people. Right. And if someone talks to me, that's crazy. What was happening on this bus? Like, how do you meet like your co-founder of 12 years on a bus? And then to go on and launch two companies, two very stressful companies. That's like a an angel pairing, I feel. Like that was total fate. That's so crazy. No, you're right. Again, showing our age, I'm like, did people talk to each other on the bus before they like stared at their phones like we all do now? Like, did Wait. people do that? Like, I kind I of was feel thinking like, no. about that too. <laughs> Yeah, you take like any transportation now and everyone's on their phone. And I'm like, what did people do before this? Were they just staring at it? I mean, they do it now. But like, were you reading the paper? Like, maybe it's like one of those things where kids are like, when you were growing up, was the world black and white? It's like, yeah, like sepia toned. (laughs) Like what was going on? I just think that's crazy. And the one other thing I want to add is just like learning about their Taylor Swift music video is so funny. Like, sure, it's just a small thing that they like put together as a team or whatever. But I don't know about you, but like reading all the stuff about founder mode and stuff like that recently where it's like there's just whole 
culture where it's just like you have to be like insane 24 7 and you have to be so intense and you have to be like so aggressive and committed to your idea like whatever and it's nice to hear a company be like we just threw together this taylor swift music video at our funding round yes it comes back to it's like don't people start companies because they're passionate about solving the problem like have some fun with it like you're devoting your whole life to doing this like i don't know i like like those like human aspects you get sometimes People are looking for excuses to be insane. And I think we should all just be silly for a yeah. moment. Let's like embrace silly. The world is already so serious. Like, let's be silly. I'm not saying I'm a Swifty, but I don't know. More of that. More fun videos like that from founders. Enough of the, the Twitter debates. Like, what are we doing here? No, there's this bumper sticker on a car in my neighborhood that I, I love so much. And it's like, the world is full of despair and yet I remain silly. And that's why it's like, and you need- I remain silly. You have to do that kind of stuff. Okay, maybe I will be a founder just to make a music video. Okay, I'll hold you to that. Found is hosted by myself, TechCrunch senior reporter Becca Skutak, alongside senior reporter Dominic Midori davis Found is produced by Maggie Stamets with editing by Kel. Our illustrator is Bryce Durbin. Found's audience development and social media is managed by Morgan Little, Alyssa Stringer, and Natalie Kreisman. TechCrunch's audio products are managed by Henry Pickovit. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Hold up. 